were still in existence at that time. Uh, and uh, there were two or three posts left. The main post was at Fort, Fort Riley, North, uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. That's one of the oldest forts in the United States. What fort was that? Fort Riley, uh, Fort Riley. Thank you. One of the, it was one of the oldest. Uh, that's where everybody met during the, uh, when they were headed for California, they stopped off at the Fort Riley. It was the biggest outpost there was at the time. And, uh, so anyways, I went down and I enlisted and uh, within no time I'm on my way into the Army. So I signed up and I, uh, I'm in, I live in the uh, Hartford area. Westfield, actually, and I joined up in Hartford, and uh, they shipped me out after my medical exam, they give you a medical exam, they ship you to uh, like a replacement area, and the replacement area was Fort uh, Ayers, was uh, Camp Ayers, Massachusetts. Where most of the guys went from the, that lived in the east coast. And how old were you at this point? I was going to be 18 years old. Somewhere around, I guess that's about it. So, so anyway. After the medical exam at Camp Ayers, what happened next? Uh, I went to Fort Devens. That was an Ayers Mass. And uh, they took and they just put us in different units and the ones the guys that were shipping out west which I was shipping out west with but in one barracks the guys that were shipping in different localities in the United States were certain was living in certain different barracks. But the uh, the train I was going on was going through uh, New York State and then through Chicago and then on its way to Kansas. So this is, I get on a train and I'm sitting on the train with everybody and stuff and uh, headed for Fort Riley, Kansas, which is the, uh, one of the outstanding camps for horse cavalry in Fort Riley, Kansas. And uh, that's where my basic training starts too. So. so you take your basic training before you take your, before they assign you to a, a horse or any horse equipment. So. I'm going through the basic training, which is uh, very interesting, and I'm having no problems in basic training. And, uh, the only problem I had, I think I was uh, a little bit too powerful for that outfit myself. How do you know? Yeah, because they were fighting the Japanese, and they have uh, the Japanese were using a lot of what they call back in them day jujitsu, which is a form of throwing people and like wrestling. And, uh, they brought these experts in there to train us to fight the Japs, but in case I started to send to Japan, so I could fight uh, Jiu Jitsu against them, see? Which I thought was a bunch of baloney because uh, I'm not going to use no Jiu Jitsu. I got my fist. I used to be a fighter even before the war. So, they come, this, this guy comes, he takes a couple of guys, he throws them around, and then he comes to me, he says, uh, Okay, you're next. You call me the start one. You come in here. So I come out. I'm standing there. He comes up and he tries to move me. He can't move me. So he tries three or four different ways. I, I, the guy couldn't move me because I was stapled to the ground. I guess the Lord up above made it so he couldn't move me. I don't care what they did. They couldn't move me. Then he got two guys and they tried to move me. And they still couldn't move. So the guy finally whispered in my ear and he said, listen, you better move or you're going to be on KP for a week. So I relaxed and I moved and let the guy throw me, you know. Otherwise, they would have never moved me. I was like, a, back in them days, you couldn't move me. If I made up my mind, nobody was going to move me, they couldn't move me. But uh, if I let them do it, it was great. So that was one of the instances there going through basic and... Uh, the basic trainer was, was, was tough, but it was tough enough that we were running we were mostly on all the old horse trails and everything. That a lot of, there's a lot of mountainous land in Kansas anyways. So what happens is, one of the incidents there is, uh, they got a black horse cavalry at this time and a white horse cavalry. 
What's the difference? It was segregated. What was different? It was still, uh, they still put the, they never mixed the whites and the blacks at that time at all. So, I don't know which calorie was better, because I never really figured that out. But uh, Joe Lewis was in charge of uh, the uh, the uh, sport and end of the uh, uh, training for the black troops. He was teaching people how to box, and he was a sergeant at the time. So I'm standing there in line. We're all waiting to go to a movie, and uh, I see Joe Lewis walking down the road. Geez, what a brute of a man. You wouldn't believe the size of this guy. So I run over to him, and I'm shaking his hand. I feel like I'm shaking hands with a gorilla. And he signs at me, and I got a big hand. And I says, come on, Joe. I said, Jesus, good to see you. So why don't you come to the movies with us? He says, you want to go? To I said, yeah, come on. I got a good movie going on. So I bring him over, and I get him in line with me. And all the guys started screaming and yelling. They don't want that person in this line, that type of person. See? So... Uh, Joe says, geez, I think I better go. I don't want to make any trouble, you know, because he was standing there with all them like the southern boys and they're tough and rednecks. So at least I got to meet Joe Lewis anyway. So did you have an option at that time as to which outfit you'd be assigned to or where you would go? No, had no option. In fact, uh, the uniform that they gave us, we thought we were going to Alaska. It was all heavy, heavy, heavy. Well, back in those days. You didn't see any good. Well, most of the uniforms we had came from World War One. There wasn't to get heavy, heavy, heavy clothes and uh, all, all uh, nothing modern. And uh, so they give you an issue. They issue this to you, and you figure, well, I'm on my way to Alaska. You never see such heavy stuff to wear. So I says, it's uh, gonna be pretty hard riding a bike up in Alaska. You know. Unless you got skis on it, but I don't think they had them during them days. But uh, I went down to, we went to uh, Camp Children, New Jersey, is where we went. That was a, what they call the uh, shipping out point for the United States Army to go. To, then we find out we're shipping out, and I'm shipping out on a British ship. And I said, Jesus, maybe I'm going to England, right? We get on the ship, take our bikes with us. I said, see, this is something. And again, the guy said, we're going to, after we got out a few days, submarines will follow you out. See, the submarine will follow that boat out three miles. I'm not the submarine, but the, an airplane will. See, there's no submarines come near you. Now, this boat went over by itself. Usually, they go over by convoy. But this troop, I don't know how many troops they had in this here thing. Three or four thousand in one boat, and uh, what they do is after they get out so far, they zigzag that boat like uh, this and that every so many, every three or four minutes, so you can't line up a, a, su a submarine can't line up a torpedo on it, a German sub. There was a lot of German subs in American Harbor, and uh, we made it through. And then about halfway over, we found out that we were heading for uh, and heading for North Africa. And the invasion was just going on. So, we come into, uh, the, the food on a boat was terrible. It was all British food. British don't eat like the Americans. So, I spent most of my time eating Hershey bars out of the PX. They had a little PX on it. What's the PX? PX is, uh, where you can go and buy, uh, anything, uh, that's, uh, Part of the army uh, exchange, where they exchange, they where you can buy stuff. Huh? So you buy things like candy yeah. bars, cigarettes. Candy bars. Now you can, you can buy uniforms back in the state, the big PA. So I started eating Hershey bars. Then I couldn't sleep. I got on a hammock, and the hammock was going like this. I stepped on the table, the table was going like this. And there's got to be an answer to this thing, you know. And uh, the bathtub. It was all salt water. You couldn't take a shower. There was no fresh water on the boat. So, just drinking water. But the salt water was hot in the bathtubs. It was a, uh, this was a luxury liner previous to that, like they have today, but really junky. And, uh, for tourists, you know. 
So I got in the bathtub and I filled it up with salt water. Warm water. And that's the way I went overseas, just sitting in the bathtub. And the water was going back and forth and I was sleeping good. I finally found a spot that would fit my body. So we landed in North Africa. And uh, Do you remember where you landed in North Africa? I think it was in uh, Casablanca. Casablanca in that area, whatever it is, that area is. I don't know what it is. They call it French Morocco. French Morocco. And uh, the invasion was already made at that time. And it was the 7th and 8th armies that were active in this area, yeah, correct? Yeah, at that time. So anyways, uh, I got thrown into a, a replacement depot for a mechanized unit which was Patton's unit, Patton's outfit. So, it was a few, a few incidents where you take the bike out and you ride out in front of tanks, you come back in again, things like this. And a real bad job, anyway. I mean, uh, I wouldn't volunteer for it. I finally went in and I told the officer there, associated with Patton there, and I said, I'm all through here. I said, I joined the Rangers. They had a big sign there that said, if you think you're tough, join the Rangers. So but you saw a sign, and that made you decide to join the Rangers? That's when I decided. Well, it was no fun riding out in front of the tanks, and the tanks never came back. The tanks never came back. There were tin lizzies. Like, Germans had uh, 88 and big Mark IVs, and we had tin lizzie. Nothing. Them poor guys went out with a medium tank, and uh, one time Pat even took and mined the damn Kasserine Pass so that they chased the Merkins back in that the Germans couldn't come in through it. And the Germans were running back, the Merkins were coming back like hell. They mined it after they went through, and all the Merkins got blown to pieces with our own mine. And this is a crazy outfit. I got to get out of it. So I joined the Rangers, and uh, I think they were a little bit happy I was gone anyway. So, what makes you think that? Well, they claim that they can get all the Pollocks they want, but they can't get Harley Davidson. That's what they fear. So, uh, I took my bike with me. And I took my bike over and I said, This is my bike. <laughs> I brought it all the way from Fort Riley. And uh, I thought I was going to keep the bike. I talked to, uh, they had two guys there Captain Sam and a guy by the name of Stunson, who was directly in the. Uh, Darby. And he said, oh, when you get into the outfit, you're going to become a, you got a bike, you're going to be running errands between companies. I said, geez, this is nice. I, said, you know, I don't have to fight. So I get in there. <clears throat> the first thing I come in, I come riding in with the bike. Darby, the colonel that runs the outfit, sees the bike, takes my bike away from me. They give me a BAR. You're a big guy. You need a BAR. You don't need no bike. What's a BAR? Well, I brought an automatic rifle. It's got a bipod on it in, uh, in the front, and it's uh, bigger than the M1, a lot heavier. And uh, the, uh, what's a good gun? It had a lot of power. It had a clip, a 20 clip or a 30 clip in it. So that was going to be my gun when I went into action. So we train in the ranges. The ranges are tough. It's a volunteer outfit, and uh, even over in there, right on the front line, it's still a volunteer outfit. You, you got to volunteer to get in it. Uh, you really don't have no say so what you're going to be doing. I found that out. So I became a BAR guy. So I found that out. So it wasn't much of a trade giving up your motorcycle in exchange yeah, for a BAR. You're not kidding. I had a Tommy gun on a motorcycle. Tommy gun. The Tommy gun on a motorcycle is right in the front wheel. And also you got crash bars on the bike. You got he if he had them on that bike. I could go down the road on that bike with them crash bars, you know, and you could hit forty miles an hour and I could drop that bike on a black top road and be shooting that Tommy gun. I don't have to have him take it out of the scabbard and be shooting it within minutes. That's why I like that bike. And it was, you know, I thought I would be doing the same thing with the Rangers, but I got fooled. They took the bike away from me. Plus, I uh, when I was little in the uh, when I was 
back in that uh, first uh, first cavalry outfit, was the first cavalry and armor division. I guess it used to be a cavalry outfit, but they call it now it's a armored and uh, Patton's outfit's part of it. And, uh, that bike is, uh, you know, it's, the bike is uh, hard to take care of. They get sand and them things too. And a VAR is worse, I found it, than a bike is. A VAR has a bolt action on it, which you pull the bolt back and it leaves the chamber open. And if you get sand in the chamber, they're kind of going to shoot. Forget about it. So we train basic training. We take our training with the British commandos, which originally trained the Rangers. And uh, we're coming in on rubber boats and they're shooting the heels off our shoes. So we had helmet liners on there putting bullets right through the helmet liners. The British commandos, they're, they're tough, you know. You get in a foxhole and they're shooting over your head and they'll throw a hand grenade in a foxhole to get you out of it, to crawl underneath the flyer firing. If you stay there, you're going to blow up by the top by, by the, by the uh, grenade, so you got to crawl. And that's where you learn to crawl in action, and you crawl, let me tell you. Because you don't want to get to be there when that, go, that thing goes off. You only got three seconds. And, uh, so anyway, the first speech that I'm making is uh, going to be in Jela, G-E-L-A, in Sicily. And uh, they have, uh, I can't remember the town that were close to. It was about right in the middle of the island. You come in off the Mediterranean. And, uh, They, they practice this uh, beachhead so many times that they, uh, the terrain that you hit when you come in on a beachhead is pretty close to the same terrain that you're going to hit when you make the beachhead. They find a place in Africa somewhere that's just about the same way on the beach as that beach you're going to hit. So you run this thing about 10, 12 times before you go in. And then when you get there, the grounds is just about the same, so you know just which way to go. So what happens here is uh, they put me in front of a boat because I got a BAR, an automatic weapon, and I'm on the first wave. You're the first one's going in, and uh, I'm going in, and the boat's coming in on in the back of me, and the, the mortar squads are uh, they got their mortar. The, the, a, a ranger will wear. Uh, Carry mortar squad, I mean mortars for 60 millimeter mortar. You carry six pieces of dynamite. You carry all this extra equipment in case the mortar squad needs weapons or something. You can replace them. You can be carrying their mortars for them. So when you got when you go down with that and all the VAR equipment, you ain't coming back up again. What do you mean then, go down with that? Huh? What do you mean go down with that? Go down under the water if the boat sinks. So these mortar squads, are, they're carrying a base plate for a 60 millimeter mortar, and also they're carrying the ammunition, and they're carrying the mortar, which is like a ch little small chimney. And uh, they're coming in way over the other side, and they knocked them. The, the uh, it had like a, not a chain, but a cable. The bullet hit the cable and the door opened. And the, all these guys were too lazy. They had the mortar shells, six of them on them. I don't know, three in the back and three in the front or more, even more. And they had them tied. And then you're not supposed to tie them. See? So they went right down. You never seen them off. The whole boat, the whole mortar squad completely disappeared. And because uh, of well, one of the bullets that came in and hit the cable and opened the door. Well, I came in in the uh, first wave, first one, and they hit a sandbar. So they figure, uh, they thought they hit the shore. So I got chicken wire with me, which they throw on top of barbed wire so you can run over it. And uh, the chicken wire, yeah, I got that, I got the Tommy, the, the VAR, and I got the uh, the mortars and everything on my back, I got about, I'm over 100 pounds on me. So I went right to the bottom. They dropped me off. They hit a sandbar by mistake. 
and I went to about 10, 12 feet of water. So I learned from the British commander that if you ever go into water like that, you're not going to be able to swim, so forget about it. Don't start taking off your equipment. Just use your arms like this and keep doing this and keep walking. And I walked right up on shore. So I'm the only guy on the beach. There wasn't me on the beach yet, you know. If I look back, nobody's coming in but me. They went back, they made another run so they could get it come up from it, hit a spot where they could drop the men off. In the meantime, I'm, I go in there and a uh, shell goes right off next to me. They're shooting at me. And uh, I figured, geez, I'll jump in that shell hole. And uh, they, the guys told me, uh, no, you don't have that much experience on the front line. You only what you hear from the guy. And they say the shell very seldom hits in the same spot twice. So I jump in a hole with this VAR equipment. That gets full of sand. You can forget about that thing shooting when the chamber got to go forward. If you had an M1, it, as soon as you pull the trigger, it goes off and then it starts. So it works itself. But a VAR, you gotta, it's got to go forward first. So if it don't go forward, you got no gun at all, you know. So I'm on that beach and I jump in that hole. Now I'm not, I got no gun. I got a 45 on my side. That thing's going to shoot. So I get behind a, a big couple of boats and dry dock with a big, big plank and maybe 16 inches thick. Two Italian machines, I don't know if they're Italian or what they are, started cross right at me. So I'm the only guy there anyway that they can shoot at. Everybody else, nobody come on the beach. I said, I hope they don't go. Decided not to call this beach that off and leave me there. So they're cutting down this log right over me, and I'm going deeper in the sand. And they're cutting a the log more, and I'm going deeper in the sand. So the VAR didn't shoot, so I couldn't do shit with it. So maybe 20, 25 minutes later, they finally came in. And I hear them yelling, calling my name. Hey, Ray, hey, Ray, where are you? I said, be careful when you're coming over here. I said, they've got two machine guns cross-firing. So they came in, they gave him come up with a bazooka gunner, and uh, he says to me, where are they? I says, well, you'll find out fast enough. I said, and they're both shooting at me. And uh, I says, he got up with that bazooka, he knocked them both out. So... It must have been a big relief to have them show up on the scene. It was a relief, but it was a good relief. So... Then I go up the path, we go up the path and we take the town, house to house fighting. And uh, put the town is still occupied by Germans and Italians, soldiers. And we finally take that town. We're all set, we got the town and we got the perimeter taken. And uh, we got the, uh, an engineer outfit comes in, they call it combat engineers. We have no, uh, no backup at all. We're on that beach all by ourselves. We take up our positions, and we, the only thing that comes in to back us up now is the combat engineers. And they carry heavy equipment. They carry 30 caliber lights. They carry mortars, and they carry, uh, they even got 50 caliber guns. And uh, they're back, they're our backing. So what happens is, we're sitting there in these houses, and pretty soon these the tanks are coming into the town, and uh, they're shooting at us and trying to blow us up and get us off the beachhead. And this is where Darby, we proved that Darby was a good man. He jumped right up on top of one of the tanks and just dropped a hand grenade right in it. He was a good soldier. So we finally knocked these tanks out, and the tanks leave town, whatever was left. Were these uh, German tanks or German Italian tanks. tanks? I don't know what the hell they were at the time. Could have been German, but I don't know what they were. Uh, so anyway, I'm walking along, and uh, after the beach has been established, I'm going somewhere or somewhere with another guy. And Darby is sitting there with Patton. So they're talking, and Patton says, Oh, you got that Polak now. You think they were the presence back in that day? Yeah, and Darby said, yeah, and he's one of my best men. And I kept walking. I felt good, you know. Because that Patton didn't think too much of me. And I didn't think too much of him either. So, 
we get in there, we get established, and all of a sudden we see a, a, through a pass coming maybe about 3,000 soldiers coming across into the, coming across in that field. And all we got is a couple of battalion, a couple of, uh, maybe uh, two battalion of rangers along that area there. How many men are in the rangers battalion? Uh, there's five something, maybe six, but uh, there's 53 men in a company. Something like that. And there's six companies in the outfit. So figure, what, six, five, three hundred guys in a battalion. So maybe two, three battalions. Uh, the draw we had was three battalions. So you figure six, twelve, eighteen hundred men would, would back up, maybe. And, uh, all of a sudden, you got three thousand guys coming across, and they're pulling their caissons, and they got horses, and they're all Italians. Thousands and thousands of Italian soldiers. So you could see that it was a cotton field, and they're coming across a cotton field. And the Germans are in back of them, pushing them forward. See. So I said, how the hell, you, you know, how much ammunition you got? You can start shooting, you can, sure, now you're running out of ammunition, and they're going to overcome you. You're going to be back off that beach here, and you're going to go somewhere. So all of a sudden, they call it for the Navy, and and the Navy starts shooting at these guys coming across the field with 16 inch guns, you know, big 16 inch guns are big. And boy, they blew the people all to pieces. They're laying all over the goddamn plane. They had horses cased on there. They had no modern equipment at all. And uh, they saved us. They stopped them. Anyway, the Navy stopped them. So anyway, they were pretty well established. And the guy said, well, he said, no, if they're all knocked out, we'll probably be moving out. He says, the paratroopers are going to come in and jump in front of you. I said, geez, that's great. So the 82nd Airborne, 505, 504, X Battalion, 505th, they're going to jump. Now, there's 36 C-47s. And uh, I don't know, maybe each... Uh, Plane probably carried 30 guys. I don't know, maybe in that vicinity. So they come flying over us. 36 C-47s come flying over us, and they're going to jump in front of us and reinforce us. Now, wasn't the British Navy being harassed by German air forces at that point? Yeah, pretty yeah, constant yeah, basis. Were. And all of a sudden, they thought the these planes were German planes. So the American Navy and the British Navy open up on them and they knock 36 airplanes full of paratroopers out of the sky. And these guys are coming down and we think they're Germans, you know, and we're shooting at them. You know, because the Americans were supposed to jump four or five miles in front of us. And then all of a sudden we find out the GIs, most of them are dead anyways, half of them are. And they, that's how many guys they killed, 36 plane loans. You don't hear too much about this here in one night. And that's one of the mistakes of the war, one of the big mistakes of the war. And then we pulled out and we went into a, we crossed the, uh, through the cotton field and all them dead bodies at night. And we attacked at a town by the name of Butera, which was part of Sicily. It was on top of a mountain. And, uh, I'm meeting Johnny C. Johnny C is, uh, out of a different company, but he is different. So I'm, I'm, by this time, I'm scouting, and I got no, I threw away the VAR. I'm not going to use that VAR, it stinks. I got myself an Italian machine gun out of one of the Italian nests. And uh, at least the Italian machine gun shot. VAR, you get a little dirt, and it's not worth the damn. So uh, one of the pillboxes they knocked out there, I went over and I got the machine gun out of it, and I'm carrying the machine gun with it. So we're going up that hill, and uh, a lot of uh, German equipment and everything got bombed by the bombers. They're all burning on that road that we're going up. And we're all going along real slow, and uh, all of a sudden you hear a click, click. I figured, Jesus, you could hear the guy pulling back his bolts. They must be in the. You know, I don't think we wait. We hold up, and the click, click. All of a sudden, I looked down, the bullets are falling out of that goddamn machine gun, a piece of crap. We, I thought they were pulling back bolts. And I said to Johnny, said, look at this here, you wouldn't believe it here. So 
So Johnny says, I'm going to go scout ahead a little bit, and I'll be right back. So he went off the road and somewhere. I thought maybe he was going to the bathroom. I don't know how he was going. All of a sudden, I hear a whole bunch of shooting. Jesus, what the hell's going on? Pretty soon, about 15 minutes later, Johnny's back again. I said, what happened? He said, he said, I ran into a little trouble over there. He killed 35 Germans in 15 minutes. They were all in a talking in the pile there, and he killed them all. And they had him written up in a life magazine. And so he was, a, he was a real good soldier. I went into Palermo for a while, and then we went to a town by the name of Caltana Seta, and uh, we stayed there, we did some guard, bringing the soldiers, the Italian soldiers and the German soldiers are in a, in a soccer field. And the Italian soldiers are telling us, we're going to get them Germans. We're going to get them when it gets dark. And I'm laughing at myself. They're scared of death of them Germans. Scared of death of them. Yeah, they wouldn't have, all the time, they still are. So anyways, we got the Germans over here and the Italians over here. So then they said, okay, the Italians are going to go start going back to the States. Because the Italians, uh, they're prisoners of war, and they're going to bring them by train down to the boats. So they get uh, put them on the train, so I'm a guard on the train. And hey, this is bullshit, you know, to myself. So I go down with one load, the train slows down, and all the time I got the gun, and all the times they're jumping on the train. Instead of jumping off to run away, everybody wants to go to the States. Like, what a sucker I am. They're going to the States, and I'm going to stay here and fight for them. You know. So I go back, and I go back to that uh, soccer field, and I says to myself, well, a lot of women are coming around, mothers and some of the soldiers in there. And uh, I says to myself, Jesus, I said to the mothers, I said, well, maybe you can get the civilian clothes for them, and you can take them home. I'd rather see them escape <laughs> and go back to the States. So they start bringing their clothes in. I, they all just get dressed up in the tag clothes, and they all leave. <laughs> Goodbye. I'm glad to get rid of them anyway. Now I got the Germans. I got that now. Montgomery is trying to beat Patton to Messina. Like, uh, whoever gets Messina first, it's right, at the, right before the Buddha bit me. And, uh, whoever takes the town first is going to be the, uh, the hero, right? There was a lot of tension between the 7th and the yeah. Army right then, wasn't there? And you see that at the, uh, they showed a movie, a Patton movie, it shows Patton inside there when Mark, when Montgomery gets there. But before Patton got there, we came in off the top of the mountain. We were down in the town already with nobody to fight or nothing. The Germans were this time making the greatest escape that was ever made. They got all the African troops across the Straits of Messina without any of them getting killed or anything. Oh, the American yeah. Army and Navy and everybody's there. And they moved the whole army, the whole British Army, across, I mean, uh, not a German Army across. And they moved them up into Italy. And uh, here we are. These two guys racing against each other. But we had to get out of the town so Patton could come in, so Patton could take the town. So he, so when Montgomery comes driving in, there's Patton sitting there with all his men. He's so proud that he took it first. He didn't realize that we had taken that town already. There was nothing there anyway, you know. So, but all the Germans got away. All the Germans that were in North Africa that didn't get killed, they got away. But anyway, we get inside this here urban area, and, they're, and then the Germans are trying to pass break through the pass to get us because they know we're observing for the artillery on the, into the Salerno, the town of Salerno. So about this time, the Germans got the best of us. They got tanks and everything down there, and they're pushing that 36th Division. The other part of the 36th Division landed with the 45th, I think, and the 3rd in Salerno proper. And these guys are getting beat bad. And they're getting pushed back off the beach. So a guy calls, comes over to me, and he says, uh, we got to get some British officers. I was there, they were with me up on top of that mountain. And they say to me, uh, there's going to be some big shells coming over from the Navy. In the meantime, I'll yell if I think it's going to hit the mountain. 
you know, them shells were so big they pick you up out of Fargo and drop you, you know. But they couldn't observe that well there. So once we got up to Chunzi Pass, they said, we're going to go up to Chunzi Pass. I said, good. So the guy says, we got to get a telephone out there, right? I said, good, okay. So they put me and another guy on a roll of telephone wire. And we're already on the other side of the mountain where the Germans are, and we're walking along a path. I'll be a son of a bitch if I don't fall off that gun. I go off the side, and I punch, fall right in a bunch of Germans. And my feet are moving so fast, <laughs> they didn't even know what the hell happened. But the kid had held the wire. He held it from going with a big rope. And I ran like a badger. You could hear shooting and everything. They didn't know what, what the hell came down there. You know, heard it about 30 feet. I fell down right into the midst of it. So I run down and I figured for the pass one here. And I went back and I found the kid and I got the wire. And this chunky pass. It's a road and they had a restaurant on top. You go out, and then it had a big circle like this around this big mound, and it was a curve and it went like that. And the German, this was German territory. So I go all the way out there with the wire, and the British come out with me, and the British get up in front, and they're observing for the artillery on the Navy boats, see? And we're guarding the rear. So me and this guy, Robertson, I just see he just died for crazy. He was 90 some years old in California. And uh, they drafted this guy. He had like eight, nine kids, and he was living some town in the south. He was working for like the native paint store. And they, these towns here, you know, they got a draft board, but they never draft their own family, their own friends. They draft this poor bastard. He got eight kids. They draft him. And he's telling me, he says, Jesus, right? I got to make it. I'll sustain the army. They're supporting my kids, my wife, everybody, he said. All I got to do is fight. He was a pretty good soldier, skinny, but real rebel. So him and I are out there guarding the, uh, the Navy. And the, the Germans are coming up every night. Instead of going around that road and walking all the way around, they're coming up this path and cutting off the circle. They don't have to walk that far. And they're walking right by me, foxhole. I can reach out and grab them by the leg, see? And they said, don't do that. We don't want you to do that. Let them go by and let them go scout up in the behind. You guys stay real quiet. So the British are looking right down on the German tanks, and they got Red Cross markers on top of the tanks. They got all the trucks with Red Cross signs on them, you know. But these guys, the, German, the, the British know it. And they started bringing in these 16-pounders. I see him hit a guy on a motorcycle who was going on a road with a 16-pounder. He was riding, running along a German, running from one country against the other, and they whacked him right off. Off the battleships out in the, I mean, the, the cruisers out in the harbor. And uh, they started knocking the shit out of him, and they saved that big jet. We saved that big jet, five of us. Well, not five, all the guys in the Navy boat, but I'm up in the front guarding these guys. Every night, the goddamn Germans walk by. I wanted to get them past it so bad, I couldn't touch them, see. And it was, you had to be real quiet up there because you're on the German side of the line. Maybe, maybe about a, three quarters of a mile, you're in off the front line. So that's where I think I got my malaria. Every night, I'd go over to this farmhouse. I'd say to Robinson, I said, geez, I go over go to a well and like, you can't light a match, you can't do nothing. You can't put a flashlight on. And I dropped the damn bucket in the well, and the goddamn bucket would never go down to get the water. And I keep jiggling it and jiggling it, and finally I get over to the side and I get some water. But we were taking our Adderburn pills and stuff, that you, you know, malaria pills. <clears throat> After the thing is all over, the British come marching through, I go over the other side and look at them, well, there's a big dead dog in there. The Germans used to do this all the time. They put a dead dog in a well so they contaminate the well, so you can't drink the water. And I think that's where I got my malaria. But I didn't get the malaria until I got in the German prison camp. So that's when my body got run down the resistance and everything. So we saved that beachhead. So you, then we came in and... Uh, when we came in there, it was what they call the Almafi Drive. I don't know if you ever heard of it. That goes right down into Naples. 
you go by they call Castle Lamar, you go by Sorrento, beautiful, beautiful area in Long Beach. So they're talking about, you know, you know, 82nd Airborne is heading out down that way. Everybody is. But I'm drinking wine with this Mexican guy, right? And pretty soon, uh, they must get on the road and run out of wine. See if we can find some more wine. So we'll go to the, to the British troops. They got rum, you know. They got a rum ration every day, a shot of rum. And we're trying to get it. They say, you want a spot of tea, eh? I said, I don't want a goddamn tea. And we're looking for something to drink. We got no guns. We got no nothing, right? And uh, this Mexican kid was a buddy of mine. I was the only one that slept with a Mexican kid because they wouldn't sleep with Mexicans back in them day. You know, they were like sleeping with a black guy. I said, what the hell, is it? if you're Polish, you're sleeping on anybody, I don't give a shit over it. So, the two Mexican guys were my best buddies. They were Aztec Indians or something, Mexican Aztecs. Both of them died for me. One's name was Danny, I don't know what the other guy was. They both protected me. One guy took a bullet right between the eyes for me. He was the nicest looking guy you ever see. And, uh, it's him and I that are going up this road trying, trying to get some wine. We forgot about the outfit. So we're going into, into territory that hasn't been taken yet by anybody. See? So we come into this town. We don't even realize that the town is uh, Sorrento. And there was a big song about it, Take Me Back to Sorrento, and uh, very, very popular. And I didn't know that Darby wanted to take Sorrento and he wanted to be the hero and everything. I have no knowledge of this until afterward. So we get into Sorrento, and the Germans are still there. We're in this side, around a corner. The Germans have got their Lister bag still there. The Lister bag carries water. And they're packing their stuff, getting ready to go. You know, and I ain't got no gun or nothing. So we went over and talked to this Italian woman. I got some aqua for water. And she asked me if I was hungry, you know, and I said, yeah. So she made me a chicken cacciatore, you know. And I'm eating it out of my helmet. Then I go look around the corner. Me and this guy are both eating, drinking. Then she got us some wine. We're drinking wine. And uh, pretty soon I look, I see the, the Germans are leaving, you know. So I said, well, that's good. The Germans are gone. We couldn't, we didn't have no guns anyway, so we couldn't do nothing anyway. So then all of a sudden I hear some noise coming down the road. And down the road is coming Ernie Pyle and Darby. And, uh, and all the Rangers are marching behind him, and they're in the Jeep. And he wants to take Sorrento so bad he can taste it. <laughs> this is funny, though, actually, when you think about it. And then he comes right in, and some guy shoots a gun off. I said, what the hell are you shooting at? I said, the Germans left a half an hour ago. And Darby says to me, he says, you Pollock, you, he says, boy, was he mad call me Pollock. <laughs> he says, you'll be digging shit all the rest of the time you're in Italy. He said, you're broke right now. I said, because only a corporal <laughs> broke me right down to nothing. And uh, he says, I can't understand. How did you ever get up here? I said, I don't know. We just walked up the road. <laughs> <laughs> and Ernie Pyle is laughing like hell. He's Ernie Pyle is laughing because Ernie Pyle, it had to be Ernie Pyle because he was about the only one that was sticking close to our outfit all the time. There was a lot of newspaper reporters. So he broke me out of nothing. So he brought, they were carrying my equipment. The guy had my Tommy, at this time I'm a first scout. Here I am, scout with no gun, right? Carrying my equipment and everything. And I got my Tommy gun back and we went with Mark and we went down and we helped the 82nd take. Uh, Naples, and we moved into Naples into the Botanical Gardens, which was a beautiful area, right in the center of town. But the people down in the Naples had no water, you know, so we went over to the place that had bottled water. We got a charge of the bottled water. You could get anything for a bottle of water, you know. And uh, we're sleeping in a Botanical Garden, really beautiful. So. <clears throat> The Germans took and they uh, mined the uh, post office that was in Naples. And they mined that post office so it wouldn't blow up until two weeks after we were took Naples, when they were leaving, you know. I could tell you some crazy stories. We would 
we don't, we don't want to put them on here. That's how fast we came into that town. So anyways, after the post office gets in there, they all set up the whole post office for two weeks. Everybody's getting their mail. The whole goddamn post office blew up. I don't know how many guys got killed, you know. And uh, uh, then we started going forward. And all the Germans were sleeping. The tanker park was a tank open. They are all parked here, but we couldn't find the keys to the top. And the Germans, they take their barracks bag, with, they don't have a barracks bag on the tanks, they have a box. And they put the box above their foxhole at night when they sleep. You know, and they got a lot of stuff in it, so a bullet hits with them, it's not going to go through the box. So I'm walking along, I see all these boxes, I said, what the hell is this, you know? So I lift up the box, and there's Germans underneath there, sleeping. <laughs> so we get orders to knife everybody, so we're knifing them this stupid Dobson, he goes a knife and he knifes a guy, and the guy pulls out a Luger, and that's the first shot that goes. He shoots Dobson in the stomach. And, uh, we had to go get the we had to go get that kill that German farm. But he was out of action then. I was glad to see him go anyway. But uh, we go around that house and. Uh, on the way around the house, I noticed that uh, they got a nice little Volkswagen there, and they got an amphibious Volkswagen. I said to, the, to Johnny, I said, that's mine. You take this, I get the car. Got a propeller on the back, you know, that's mine. Yeah, you get it if you're lucky. So I go around the corner again, and I see a, a hatchway going down into the cellar with ammunition in it. German ammunition shells for them goddamn... I figured just the hatchway got stuff in it, you know. I don't realize that the goddamn, they got all their ammunition underneath there in the cellar. So I throw a hand grenade in there, and I run and I jump maybe 20 feet away in a cabbage patch, and geez, the whole world went up. Holy Christ. I don't know what the hell happened. I said, well, a little bit of ammunition, but it blew up the whole goddamn area like, and, uh, I got, uh, as the, the shells are going off, they're going up in the air, the 88 shells, they got brass, and they go up, the brass weighs about six pounds, and the bullet is in front. But as they get hot and heated, and the bomb and the blowing up, the bullets go off, and the shells spin, right? So I'm laying there like this, listening to the noise, and the goddamn shell comes down and hits me right in the back. I didn't see it coming. Now I can't move my legs, I'm paralyzed. Holy Christ. So I'm laying there and bullets are flying all around. They're all shooting right at you, you know. Pretty soon this guy comes walking up near me and he says, Hey, Pollock, he just starts shooting me so we're losing. I said, Well, I got hit in the back. I said, I'm paralyzed. He said, Well, see if you can move your toes. He said, You got hit by an empty shell. I thought I got hit by a piece of shrapnel. Jesus, sure and shit, my toes are working. I said, boy, this is great. So he said, when you get your legs moving, he said, crawl over into this house over here. He said, we're going to set up headquarters. In here. So I finally crawled up, and I'm over there where, they, where they're at. And, uh, hey, we're, I thought we were winning the war. You know, I, my Tommy gun got blown up. They shot it right out of my hand. I was shooting out the window. And uh, I don't know how this German ever did it. He was... It, a lot of Germans don't even come out of the fox, so they just take their machine pistol and they go rrr, 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 like that. I don't blame them. I would stick my head up here. So I got myself an M1, and the guy who was carrying the M1 was laying on the floor there. I said, what's the matter? He said, well, I got hit in the ass. And I said, well, let me look. And he had a little sliver there, and I put some sulfur melamite powder on me. I says, uh, you'll be all right. I said, give me your gun. I got his gun. He goes, his gun's got no sights on it. Sights got shot off him. So I go upstairs, and I'm looking out the window, and I'm watching these bastards shooting. And that guy inside that foxhole, he's swinging a machine pistol like this. And he go back. Now, I got this here M1 pointed, but I, keep, I got no sights on it. But all I'm waiting for is that blur when his arm comes up, you know? And as soon as I see that blur, I know his arm is there, I pull the trigger, and he jumps up in the air. 
He grabs his upper with a jackass. And about nine guys must have shot him. I don't know who the hell shot him. And, uh, and now I got a gun with no, with just the, with no sights on the goddamn thing. And everybody's running out of ammunition anyway. So, pretty soon I'm up in a window and I'm looking out the front window. And I'm picking off a couple of Germans that are sneaking up and back. And pretty soon I see, uh, this tank coming up the road. And, uh, I said, geez, the American tanks have broke through. This is great. But what is it? It's, uh, it's a German tank with an 88 on it. Now, who do you think they're looking for? Me up in the window. They think I'm, they must have thought I was a, a observing for the artillery or as a sniper. And, uh, so I'm looking at that gun and that guy's bringing that 88 right at me. And boy, I can't move. I, geez, I, I was like in a dream sometimes. You can't run and run nothing. And that 88 is going to blow me right to pieces, you know. And this guy jumps on it by Lima McTV and he drops a hand grenade at me. And, uh, Josie met me. Save my ass, man. So, right after that, the Americans were given up. They were wiped out, practically. They were marching up the road. And as they come marching up the road, if we, if the Germans were pushing them. If you shot one of the Germans, they'd shoot ten Americans. That's how they got us. See, the guys wouldn't shoot their own men. See, if there was a German outfit, they would mow their own men down. And keep fighting, but we wouldn't kill our own guys. So as they're going up the road, they're telling more guys to get up in there with these guys, and I'm shooting the guys, the Germans that are going like this. I thought they're leading an attack, and the Americans are screaming like hell, "Stop your shooting! Stop your shooting!" Because every time you shoot a German, they shoot ten, ten Americans. I said, "What the hell kind of war is this?" I didn't know they were. They got so down they got us. They put them out in front. See. So I'm inside the, I go inside the, I'm inside the building with, uh, this guy, Sergeant Evo. He says, we go over and we're listening to the radio. And I looked down, I got it, it had the sulfonilamide on his ass. He died. He wasn't even hit. I was looking to see if he had any more bullet holes in him, but he died from fear. A lot of guys die from fear. We get so scared they die, you know. So... I'm listening to Darby talking. Darby is way back, and he's talking to Sergeant Evo, who's the Sergeant Major of the, of the Rangers. And he says, uh, he's the one that could walk over and he says, hey, Paul, I can start shooting, we're losing the war. Hey, a lot of guts. A lot of guts. So anyways, Darby says, uh, where's Captain Shunson? Where's Captain Smith? And, uh, where's so-and-so? I says, hey, they all gave up to stand out in the road. I'm talking on the radio. He said, well, he said, you guys may just well give up, too. I said, well, we're the only ones left in here. Everybody else gave up. So he said, blow up the radio and, and give up. He, I, that's just how he said it. So I said, I ain't giving up. You ain't going to get me to give up. I told Sergeant E. Hall, we blow up the radio with a hand grenade. I said, I ain't giving up. And the Germans at this time got the building surrounded. So he says, uh, well, Darby told you, you got to give up. I said, I ain't giving up. I says, I, I, that's my prerogative. I don't want to give up. I know what I'm going to do. So I'll get out of here. I was afraid to get captured. Jesus Christ. And I was ashamed to get captured, to tell you the truth. Who the hell wants to be a prisoner? So he pulls a forty-five out on me. American soldier. And you're going to give up, and you're giving up with me. I said, what the hell right are you got to pull a gun on me and make me give up? I, just, uh, I never see anything myself. I, just, I never heard of anybody making the guy give up. I don't think there's anything in the Army rule books. So he takes me over to the door, and he kicks open the door, and there's a German standing there with a machine pistol. This jackass got the forty-five on me. Like that. And the Germans looking at him. If they shoot anybody, they got a gun on them, point in their hand. 
And the, the German says, bust us loose. He's got a machine pistol on him and everything. And the, he said, well, put your hands up over your head. And he takes Ewald's 45 and he shoots over my head, two shots with the 45. Why don't he shoot over Ewald's head? You know, he's a jackass and wanted to give up. So he takes a gun and he throws a gun in the ground. He says, piece of shison. Piece of shit, he says. He says, there's a good gun. He's talking to us, you know. He takes out his Luger. Who the hell's he shoot again? Two shots over my head. I said, Jesus Christ. He also made me give up. And this guy's shooting over my head. And, uh, <laughs> but I was planning on, there was a, a pile of corn. It must have been the farmers that owned that house. had a pile of corn halfway up the steps. And I figured I'd crawl underneath that corn. You know, let them all give up, and at night I'll get out of that corn and I'll take off, see. And uh, then I started thinking, see, what if they put a bayonet in the corn like that? And I'm thinking of these things, but he wouldn't let me give up any. He wouldn't let me, he made me give up. I was just contemplating if I could stay alive. So we get out on the road, and we're walking up the road, and the artillery that we were calling for comes in. And knocks the top of that house right off. Actually, save my <laughs> I would have been in that pile of corn, spitting corn right now. So, anyways, they march us up the road and they bring us into a. <clears throat> I've had this experience before. Into a soccer field. Now I'm, in, I'm the prisoner. Back in Sicily, we had everybody in the soccer field. They were the prisoner. <laughs> Now, I'm the PLW, and they line up machine guns, and uh, all the guys rip their ranger patches off and are kicking them down in the mud, because they know that the rangers don't take no prisoners, see. So, the guy gets up there, a German, and he says, now listen, he says, we know you guys are rangers, and we know you know in English, and he says, we know you don't take no prisoners. These are... Hermann Gordon paratroopers, they're the elite of the German army. Hermann Gordon, the Air Corps was under him, heard him and the, in the, uh, and, uh, paratroopers of the Hermann Gordon. And, uh, they treated their soldiers like they would treat their own. So that's why they weren't, uh, that's why they were nicer to any shooter. He we're going to do you a favor. You're all going to go to Poland. Yay! <laughs> We're not going to shoot you. They have a hundred machine guns there. A lot of you know, they're usually they're bullshitting you, you know. You turn around and pretty soon you got the machine guns all shooting at you. And he says, you're all going to pick potatoes. Yeah, geez, I like potatoes, you know. So, uh, sure as shit, they marched us up the road. And uh, pretty soon my artillery that I've called before is all coming in and hitting us on the road and the Germans. And the German, he thinks he's a big shot, right? He's up there with the, the guy that shot the gun over me. He sees me running, jumping a gully, and he's laughing at me. And he's standing in the road like this, laughing, you know. Merton shell goes off, and Preach the strap, I'll fix him right up. He must have went down the road about 20 feet. Goodbye. He thought he was a Superman, you know. They all thought they were Superman, you know. So... Somebody gets a funny idea in the German Hitler. Oh, Hitler finds out that they've captured the Rangers. Oh, boy, this is a big deal with the German people and everybody. So now they're going to march us through Rome. And uh, they're going to have uh, uh, all in Israel, Germany, seeing the Rangers, the American, best troops in the American army got captured. So they're marching us through Rome. They brought us up by truck. And I got pictures. You can see us marching. I can't find it yet. So anyways, uh, you can see me marching up to get off and go over the road. So we get in front of the Coliseum, you know. And uh, I said, geez, at least I get to see the Coliseum. i never seen that. So the German, I got a picture of the German, too, on the side car. I was just here the other day. He comes riding up and pulls his bike right up in front of me, and he's smoking a paparosa and a cigarette, you know. And I ain't got no cigarettes. I haven't had a cigarette now for a couple of days. 
And I'm watching him smoking. I said, well, he's got to throw that butt out, you know. He's watching me, and I'm watching him. He's riding the bike, and he's got another general sitting in the boxcar on the side. So he doesn't even have a kickstand on it. The thing is holding up itself, see. So I see him take his foot and put his foot on the ground like this, and he's tapping his foot. And I'm waiting for him to get rid of that cigarette, right? So he finally takes a cigarette and he flips it right in front of me. And I'm thinking, oh, gee, that's nice. I went right down after him. He came up with his left foot and caught me right in the guy in his. Boy, you think that didn't hurt. And I'm laying on the ground. And then I go to get up, and the guy's saying, Pollock, stay down. He got a luger on your head. I'm going to kill a son of a bitch. Embarrass me and hurt me besides. I'm going after him. I don't give a shit what he got. They're all yelling, stay down, stay down. Don't get up. He's going to shoot you. So they finally came over, and they held me down. And uh, the Germans are laughing like hell, you know. And uh, I'm the only American that ever got kicked like that in front of the Coliseum, you know. I had a picture of it. <laughs> what happens is they take us to a camp and uh, they're going to load us on some trains that are going to take us to Poland, I guess, at some point. So they put us on the trains and the Americans are bombing. And all the guards are running and they leave us locked in a boxcar. And the American bombers are bombing a railroad station. So I said, Jesus Christ, we got nowhere to go, you know. So pretty soon the Americans stop bombing and the train starts moving again. Now we haven't eaten or had a cigarette or anything for maybe four or five days. So we're all sitting on the train. There's 53 guys on this train. So as they're putting us on the train, I had my ranger knife. They never found it. I had it hit in my boot. And, uh, they're checking all the guys and taking all the stuff away from them. Their cigarettes or watches and everything as they're getting on the train. Any kind of uh, knives or anything. And they don't find my knife, see. But uh, they haven't checked me yet. So I'm thinking. So I see this guy go through the line. And he didn't have nothing on him. And he's walking by and he looks over at me and I says, hold it. I get the knife and I flip the knife over the fence. He catches the knife. Now we got the, something to get out of that train with, see. So you talk about good thinking, boy. So anyways, we finally get on the train, still no food, no water. And we're heading up towards the Brenner Pad. We're still in Italy. So I finally get up after about the fifth or sixth day, and I said, listen, guys. And most of the guys are rangers, paratroopers, armored guys, all mixed up. Third Division guys. I said, I don't know anything about you guys. Maybe you paratroopers can do this here. I said, but we're going to get off this train. I said, they're, they're going to they're gonna starve us on the train. They're not going to feed us. We're going to die. The guy said, well, how the hell are we going to do it? I said, well, I got a knife, and I can get them floorboards up. So everybody chips in, except one guy had a bad leg. The other guy had a, what was wrong with the other guy? Oh, the other guy was crazy. He got hit, must have got hit in the head or something. So, uh, we're working on the floorboard. Did we get him up? That the ranger where the knife was a nice knife. It had like uh, three uh, knuckles on it. Like, this was at the, they had a British commando knife that I used to carry. It was a thin knife. You could take that and you could throw it anywhere and stick right in the wall of the man of the brass. But this was a ranger, regular army ranger issue. So very strong, very strong. Had like, I got a knife in here that looks like it, but this was small. This was smaller. So we get the boards up, and geez, the train is doing about 40 some miles an hour, and you can't fall and make the train. You try to get out, forget about it. You get killed right off the bat. And the guy said, who are you guys? We're going to go out the window. So I go over to the window, and I get the knife. And uh, they got well, the windows wired, boarded up over barbed wire and stuff. And they got barbed wire nails in it. So I get the nails out and I get the boards out. Now I got the window open. I says, okay. I says, uh, we're all going to go out. We, I get two blankets. We tie the blankets together. 
So I'm the one of the biggest guys in there. So I said, I'll hold a blanket. You guys go help two guys. Two guys help get the guys out the window. Hold on a blanket. And I said, we're going to go like the Rangers on a, a me and my buddy course. We hit one pole. We drop off a Ranger or whatever trooper. The next pole we skip and we drop off another man. And then you two guys go and meet the middle pole. And then when you could run away, you were together. See? So that's what they call your me and your buddy corps. See? And uh, it worked out well until the end. I got everybody off that train but three of us. Me and two guys. I got nobody to hold a blanket. The guy's got one leg all smashed up. And the other guy's wacky in the head. And nobody can hold a blanket for me. Now I'm stuck with the blanket. So, all of a sudden, I hear this shooting going on outside. So this guy that we had dropped off, one of the guys we were going through a freight yard or somewhere, we went right by the people and he's hanging out there on the blanket. And they teletype it to the train. And they got the machine guns, you know, are sitting right on top of the train. Now he's up there with machine guns, you know. These guys all got away. I don't know what percentage of them got away. Out of it. I think what they say the Great Escape was a bunch of bullshit. Because the, the actual number of these guys that got away were 49 guys. The only three that didn't get away were the three on the thing. And they got, and they joined the Italian Underground, a lot of them. A lot of them got picked up later on or something. I don't know what happened to them. But it, the percentage of guys that got away out of that train was close to 80, 90%. So I'm on a train, they're stopping the train. Then I hear him shooting down the aisle, see? And I go over with these two dinghies, and uh, the other guy was all right. He just had a bad leg, you know? And I said, when they make leave, you're snoring. And this other guy's sitting there like, I'm scared, I'm scared. I said, just snore. So they open up the door, and uh, we're all snoring, and I hear the guy say, Rangers, Rangers, he says. You Rangers are a lot of trouble. And then when you only see three guys in the train, he, they started kicking us. They went shit face, you know. So they couldn't hurt the guy with the leg. He was hurt bad enough. But the crazy guy, he did it. He did it. He arranged it all. He's turning me in, you know, this guy. I said, what are you, crazy? So he turns me in. Now they got me as the instigator, right? So they got the train parked in a, in a freight yard. And they open up all the doors. Now they're going to shoot me. See? And, uh... They're going to send like, this guy sitting there with a big horn, a Rudy Valley horn. They didn't have no uh, microphones like then. They had a bass book that's a, like the guy used to sing in the old days through a horn. He's a German Nazi general. And he keeps hitting me with a horse whip, you know, to get them short whips. He kept whacking me and whacking me. He said, get over there. He said, and they get the machine guns all lined up. But I really didn't give a shit. I was so goddamn hungry. I didn't give a shit if I died. I was so tired. Jesus Christ, I got every guy off that damn train holding that blanket. So, all of a sudden, I'm looking down at the train. And all the doors are open. And they got lights on me. And he's announcing that we're going to shoot this man because he instigated this whole escape. And we're going to kill him because he's the instigator. And it's going to be a lesson to all you guys in the train not to try to escape. So I'm waiting for the guns to go off and everything. All of a sudden, I see this guy jump on the train. A little guy. Then I see another guy jump off next to him. And the German guard is coming up where I am with me. This guy's a British. He got a book. He's going, Geneva Conference. The Geneva Conference. I said, what the hell is that? That's the rules of the war. See? So I figured next time you ever get captured, all you got to do is give him your name, rank, and serial number. You know. And I didn't know that there was any protection. He says, and this guy says, the general says, who's that guy there? And he says, well, he's going to tell you that you can't shoot this man. He said, put him over there. We'll shoot him with him. He says, geez, this is good. I got company. You know? <laughs> Where is your officer fixing me? Like I'm a walkout, right? So anyways, he says, uh, 
he explains to this guy, and this guy don't like it. You can't, then now he can't shoot me. He, he, he got, because we got British, uh, in Britain we got German soldiers that are prisoners, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, American. And if you shoot this man, it's going to get out that you shot a man. And it says in a book you can't shoot a man in uniform if he tries to escape. If I was in civilian clothes, they could have shot me, you know. And he talked that German out of it. And that German kept hitting me. I wrote that he kept hitting me before. I didn't write that book, you know. <laughs> Jesus Christ. He's okay, that's why I got in the train with the British guy. So anyways, uh, fortunately, we finally came to Munich. And uh, I can tell you a little story about this, too, because Josie was with me, and uh, we went on went to a reunion, and uh, we walked into the reunion, and these young ladies come running up to me. They were married girls. And they're all, are you Ray Sadowski? Yeah, I'm Ray Sadowski. And they're hugging me and talking to me. I said, what the hell are you, what are you doing? What's going on? They said, well, you saved my father's life. I said, I saved everybody's life. I just threw their ass out the window so they could get something to eat. In fact, I was supposed to go, and I couldn't get out. So he said, well, you, don't, you realize what happened afterwards? And I said, yeah, I know what happened. We got to Munich, or Mules of Germany, and they gave us some soup. And they said, all the Judah stepped forward. All the Jewish guys. So all the Jewish guys that were on the trains and the freight trains all stepped forward. They were from Brooklyn, you know, they were tough Jews. Anybody close to it, yeah. And uh, they took them all away and never seen them again. Never seen them again. So one of the guys that I got out the window on this train was a Jewish guy. And he told his daughters that by me getting them off that train on that blanket, that I saved his life. He joined the Italian underground in literature because he knew stories afterwards when the train got them moves up that they took all the Germans away and he wouldn't be alive today. So I just want to fill this in so you can see how years go by how things happen. He's dead now anyway. But he's a guy who shoot a knife over the fence though. So he really helped me. If you're less than a sergeant, you got to work. And, uh, and you work. They don't work. They go 14 hours a day. You know, you work out there in the fields. So I go out on the first, they call them commandos, is what they call them, the Germans. And uh, I'm on my first commando. I'm working on it. Now I get malaria. That goddamn malaria hits me. And uh, I don't know what the hell I got. I get so, I start shaking like hell and sweating, then all of a sudden I pass out, and I'd be all right. So what they do is they work me, throwing cow manure off the wagon to the Russian girls that were spreading it, right? And then after a while, I got the malaria, and I start shaking, and the Russian girl would take me off the wagon, she'd throw the manure off, I'm shaking, I'm shaking the manure. I got, they got the right guy, right? I got the shakes anyway, right? And then after this, you pass out. So they let me come back to the barracks a couple of days, and every day it hit me at the same time, 10 o'clock in the morning, and that thing whacked me in the ass. So they'd have to send me back in because I couldn't walk or anything anymore. I passed out. So about the third or fourth day, I never knew what happened. I got shaking like that, and I passed out in the field. I talked to a guy after the war, and he says, you know what happened to you, Ray? I says, no, I don't know what happened. They took you over to the barn where they emptied the cow shit every morning. And they threw you in the shit pile. And they figure, as the shit comes out in the morning, they're going to cover you. You'll be dead by then. I wasn't moving anyway. So, the next thing I wake up, I don't know what the hell time it is, but where I'm at, I'm in a hospital. Like some good German Samaritan or somebody picked me up and brought me to a hospital in Dachau, which is where they 
put people into the ovens. But I was in the city of Dhaka on a hospital, an experimental hospital. So they're experimenting on me for malaria, but they don't have no adabrin or anything like that that they cure mar malaria with because they steal it all when it came through from America for us, the guys that had malaria, and they gave it to the Germans. They didn't have any. So they were trying to use me as an experiment to see if they could cure me without using all this medicine that they do have, that they have a shortage of, they don't have. So, three months, I don't remember nothing. This was the second farm I was working on. And, uh, finally, uh, I finally, uh, it was around Christmas time or something. I had gone back to what they call a strop lager, a punishment camp, for anybody who escapes to go to the strop lager. Yeah, at least anybody could escape. There was nowhere to go. You may as well go right to the strop lager. But the strop lager had 82nd Airborne, Rangers, guys of this type in there, guys who are good soldiers that screwed up all the time. They weren't working with them. So, finally I decided, well, I'm going to get the hell out of here. I'm working up in Poland somewhere on a railroad or some goddamn place. There. That's where you work when you're in the strop lager. So, the Russians are coming now. You can hear the guns going off. The Germans have decided, what are we going to do? So, I get talking to this Polish girl on a farm. I says, uh, what do you say? I says, I can't, I try to escape with a couple of Americans. I says, I'd like to see, oh, the girls, I know my way through. I speak Russian, you know. So I went with her. So we went up to the Russian front. Oh, no, previous to this year, you wouldn't believe this year. Previous to this year, I come out with that the commando I'm on, and they're going to evacuate because the Russians, they heard the Russians are coming, they're going to start moving us. So there's 11 of us and 11 GIs and a guard. So it started snowing, so we started packing all our stuff on the oxen. I was driving the oxen. And uh, we got the, we were going by a schnapps factory where they made schnapps out of potatoes. So the guys went over there and they got the, the guard was a nice guy, young guy from Hamburg, Germany. I used to do proposed auto drill with his gun. He was, he was never on the front line. He like a he knew somebody he didn't have to go, I guess. So I got to be very friendly with him. And uh, he says, uh, well, let's get some of that vodka. You know, that, they call it schnapps. So we got two water cans full of schnapps. We tie them on the back of the wagon, right? We got the... Uh, these scoopers just scoop the water out of it, and we're all drinking it here. And it's snowing like a bastard. And, uh, we're, we're the hell up near Poland somewhere. I don't know how long we're at. Now all of a sudden the Russians are coming. So, we get so far down the road, and I said, where the hell are we going? I said, what the hell? Let's go back and go to the Russian line. The guard passed out. He drank so much schnapps. We got a little uh, wag, uh, sleigh. You know, they all had the runners in the front like this, the old fashioned ones. We put him in the sleigh. I got his gun. I said, let's turn this goddamn wagon around. If you listen to the guys that were on this thing, they tell on, on, on a different story altogether. A bunch of, bunch of lying southern bastards. But, anyways, uh, we turn it around and we're going. We're drinking the schnapps, and we're all singing, God bless America, we're coming home. We're going up the road, and we hit the front lines. And uh, I says, boy, I said, we, we got it made. So all of a sudden, we're going up the road, and tanks are burning around us, and both guns going off. And they're in a truck, and it's 11 GIs with the guard in the back, fast out. This made a movie, for Christ. I wish they'd make a movie out of this thing. And I'm driving them oxen, you know. <laughs> so, uh, pretty soon, off the, out, out comes the, we're almost through the lines. I bet you five more minutes, we would have made it right through to Russia, you know. So, 
This German officer comes running out and he yells, Bus is low, sir, man. Bus is too correct. He says, I mean, what are you doing? What are you, crazy? I said, we're Americans. We're going to <laughs> we're, all dr we're drunker than hell, you know. We're on our way home. He said, where's the Bachman? I said, ah, oh, he's sleeping in the back. <laughs> he said, you guys ought to be crazy. Mr. Rick. He says, uh, you're not going home. If that bastard didn't come out, we would have went right through the line. We were on our way through. Everybody was shooting and firing. And I was so drunk, I didn't give a shit. So uh, he turns the wagon around. And I'm, I'm the ox driver, you know. And uh, he takes that poor guy, that, that guard, and he shakes him awake. And he's yelling at him, what's his loss? What's wrong with you, man? What's loss with you? What are you crazy? What do we put it? And he's shaking him and shaking him. And the guy wakes up, he doesn't know where the hell he's at, right? And he's up on the front line. He says to the guy, uh, what outfit were you fighting with? He said, I never fought with no outfit. Something like that. He said, you're going to be fighting now. <laughs> Takes that poor bastard, puts him on the front line. And they get an old, old fart. We bring it to turn the wagon around, we go back. See? And uh, we go back into the farm, back to work some on another farm. But uh, that poor bastard, he probably got killed. I don't know what the hell happened to him. He was a nice guy, but it was, would have been one of the greatest escapes there was ever made. If we had got through 11 drunken GI and a guard, passed out in the thing in the back, you got to see him. You got to make a movie out of that thing. But anyways, uh, I go back and I finally talk to this girl, and, and uh, she says, I'll get you to the front line. I said, well, that's great. So we go right up to the front line. Boy, it's everybody fighting tanks. They're going back and forth. So we find ourselves a big hole. We, her and I get inside that hole. And I said, and I was in all rags. Oh, Jesus, I was in. Wooden shoes and clothes you never seen, all patched clothes, no uniform at all. All my identification I got rid of because they were looking for me, you see. And uh, they were looking for me for killing Germans, for killing German civilians. I said, I didn't kill them, German civilians. They were National Guard guys. I said, everybody that I kill, I said, had uniforms on. And I found out they were National Guards and they called them these civilians. So they even had Interpol after me after the war. I, I couldn't go over and see even after the war was over. Interpol was still looking for me for killing civilians. So I said, there were nothing but German guards. They were National Guard. They were, not, they were in the Army. They had uniforms and everything, half ass uniforms. But uh, so I took everything off me. I figured, boy, they're not going to get me. I threw away the dog tag. I threw away everything. So I go through the lines with her, and the Germans are fighting right on top of but the Russians going back and forth. Back and forth. Her and I are sitting laying in the park zone. Pretty soon I hear a German tank, a Russian tank coming up. And uh, <clears throat> I heard some Frenchmen yelling, Francois, Francois. In the dark, and all of a sudden, you're going, and the Russians don't want to give a shit about nobody. They don't care what nationality they are. <clears throat> so, this German tank came right up, and the guy says, Stadi. And Stadi in breath Polish means old. So, I figured I look like an old man, you know. So, stop. In Russian, it's Stadi. Stop. So, the girl gets up and she tells the guy, I'm an American. The guy's, you know, it's like an American, you know. It's like a bum. So she said, well, he is. And he said, good. He said, okay. He said, instead of shooting us, go back. So we go back. So I'm not going to tell them. They want to know what outfit I was with and everything. Take my name and they swear me into the Russian Army. I don't know if they swear me in or they sign me in or what the hell I know. So now I'm, uh, they put me, I told them I was in a horse cavalry figure what the hell. So they put me in a Russian Mongolian Cossack out. And they said, what's your uh, what's your rating? And I says, I'm a colonel. <laughs> he says, what kind of a colonel? He's a full colonel. 
of the corporal. <laughs> American army. So he puts me in charge of a whole bunch of Mongolians. Oh man, these guys don't even speak Russian, they speak Chinese or something. They all got slanted eyes. So I'm fighting with them to the end of the war. The war ended, so. But they took good care of me in action. They formed like a diamond around me so I wouldn't get hurt, you know? But I said, I gotta get out of this outfit. I gotta get out of here. So I said, I'll take a uniform and I got on. And I'll take another uniform and I have two Russian uniforms, you know? So I got one Russian uniform in the bag and I grab a bicycle. And I ride down the Elf River where they met the Americans. So the Russians are sitting on a bank and they pull all the furniture out of the house and they got the couches and they're drinking. Now this is just sad, you don't believe it's there. So I come riding up and I says, uh, I went up and I couldn't speak to the guy. The guy didn't speak, he didn't speak Polish, he didn't speak, uh, and I couldn't speak that good of Russian. So he didn't speak English, they had no interpreters, they're all drunk. And the guy says, shoot him. Just like that. That's what do you mean, shoot me? I said, I've been here for three years. I said, what are you going to do? He said, shoot him. You know. So I started crying. And then I said to him, maybe they speak German. So I says, uh, anybody speak German in German, you know. He's a German in a Russian uniform now. Now I'm a German in a Russian uniform. Now I'm on my knees. Don't believe don't anybody bullshit you. And I'm crying. And I said, gee, this is the end. And they shoot you just like that. And all of a sudden I hear a guy yell, I'm crying out loud. Don't anybody bullshit you. And it's like almost going across the Connecticut River, the Elbe River, you know. And uh, this guy yells, hey, Polak, is that you? <laughs> I'm a shit. A guy from Harvard, Spencer Scott, he heard me. So they come over after me and they got this. I tried to get a gun out of there, got a Russian. They're all holding all, all me. So I want to get home and now. Uh, <coughs> I'm so goddamn mad at the Russians. After fighting with them almost three months, I did do my things. And, uh, <laughs> take the uniforms off, <laughs> throw them in the Elf River, and I get off naked. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. Three years. <laughs> We've been all over one shot. Lucky thing I cried. That was I was really crying like this. <laughs> please, please. My boy said, run over that off for I said, oh, you. He said, we got my bread over here. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. No.